Well, let's examine another aspect of this story, and that's what happens next to the Huawei executive being detained in Canada. Once the bail issue settled for uh, uh, Meng Wanzhou, she will still face extradition to the United States. How will that unfold? Rob Curry is a law professor at Dalhousie University in Halifax. He specializes in extradition law, and he joins me now. Mr. Curry, thanks for taking time to speak with me today. Can, let, me, let me start by asking, first of all, uh, we have now the detention of this Canadian in, in China, and careful uh, at this point as people speculate on the link to that and the detention of, of the uh, CFO of Huawei in Vancouver and what's happening there. Uh, is there any doubt in your mind that these two things are connected, and, and any thoughts on what you think the messages the Chinese might be trying to send as at some point will be involved in an extradition process for, uh, for uh, Meng Wanzhou? Well, certainly there's not much doubt in my mind or anybody's mind that the two are related. Uh, the Chinese government indicated quite explicitly that it was displeased, that there were going to be consequences for uh, this because of their objection to Canada's arresting Ms. Meng. And you know, Peter, this is the kind of thing that happens uh, when countries get into disputes of various kinds, it's a tit-for-tat sort of situation. You arrested one of ours, we're going to arrest one of yours. Uh, you know, the individual detained is not a diplomat, but he used to be one. They can't arrest diplomats, of course. Diplomats have diplomatic immunity, but uh, he's as close as they could get. So it's, it's difficult to think that it's for any other reason at this point, other than uh, it's a response to Canada's uh, Canada's position. And certainly the the goal of the Chinese government at this point is to make the water a lot hotter. And it's doing it vis-a-vis -vis Canada at this point. There doesn't seem to be any sign of, the, of China applying pressure to the U.S. Because after all, it's a U.S. case. It's a U.S. prosecution. It's a U.S. extradition request that has triggered this entire process. But of course, the U.S. and China have been uh, having trade talks and a number of uh, uh, mechanisms designed to maybe cool off their relationship a little bit uh, lately. So Canada really is stuck in the middle uh, of a very difficult uh, diplomatic Cold War. Okay. Let's, uh, we, we, uh, we know that uh, given our extradition treaty with the United States that Canada had no choice uh, but uh, to arrest uh, Meng Wanzhou when she was on Canadian soil to, to fulfill the obligations of that treaty. But uh, does, Canada, does Canada have any role... You know, after the bail issue is taken care of and the extradition process begins at some point, does Canada have any role in deciding whether the extradition request actually has merit? Absolutely. In fact, that's what our entire extradition process is designed to do. It's all governed by the Extradition Act, which is a federal statute. And uh, the basic two stages are that, first of all, there's a court hearing. And the court hearing will determine a number of issues, including whether the crime for which Ms. Meng is wanted in the U.S. is something that we consider to be a crime here in Canada, because that's a requirement. And it's also got to determine whether the evidence that the U.S. says it has to support the prosecution is sufficient, in the sense that uh, a case with that much evidence would be allowed to go to trial here in Canada as well. So a judge makes those decisions. But to tell you the truth, Peter, it's a very low threshold for the requesting state to get over uh, most of those hearings are successful. The latter part of the process is a decision by the minister. And the minister has a number of discretionary grounds that she can employ to either accept or to refuse extradition in some cases. And we can talk about those if you want, right. but the, the real meat of it is that it's, it's practically unheard of for Canada to turn down a U.S. extradition request. And I guess that's, uh, like, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's tricky to follow this bouncing ball in this dispute with China, but that's sort of what you know, where I started initially with the question is, and, and I'm wondering if you know, the Canadian government having said it's a, it's a legal process, there's no political interference, but there does uh, there is a political element to the extradition process, as you point out. At some point, the Minister of Justice does have the power to reject extradition requests that uh, may be politically motivated or are perhaps based on uh, human rights issues, race, religion, sexuality, for example. Um, could any of those exceptions apply to this case, and is that the pressure the Chinese may be trying to bring to bear? That's entirely possible. Uh, the minister could reject, for example, on the basis that uh, the, uh, the extraterritorial nature of the American prosecution is such that Canada doesn't want to be seen supporting that kind of uh, jurisdictional overreach, you know, because what's alleged, of course, is that uh, Ms. Meng engaged in crimes, none of which touched or took place upon U.S. territory. Mm -hmm. uh, again, very unlikely politically for Canada to want to do that. 
vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. And uh, the idea that the prosecution itself may be politicized is a really difficult one for the minister in the sense that that would be a, a slap in the face to the U.S. and our longstanding relationship with them. Now, this, on the other hand, this is an unusual case, and there's no doubt these arguments will be made. On the flip side of this is, uh, I, I would assume at least, is going to be the government of Canada saying, look, we can't be seen to be bending to Chinese pressure and interference in our legal system, uh, you know, in a system which is engaged by international law obligations that we have. So it's, uh, it's a very delicate but very slow forward march at this point, because I think we can expect the proceedings to go on for a while, months, and very possibly years. Yeah, the, 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 an extradition request could, as I understand it, could be appealed all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, so how, how long could we be looking at here? for? Because as long as this process, you know, is at play in Canada, one presumes there could remain this chill over Canada-China relations. Yeah, it's hard to see it being any other way, in fact. And and as uh, as we heard in your news report or in other news reports earlier, that has happened in the past, uh, you know, that we've had uh, retaliation for situations like this that has gone on the length of the uh, the extradition process. So we're, we could be looking at a couple of years worth of time here, uh, fractiousness and friction between Canada and China, certainly maybe a spike in the government's efforts to try to warm up our trade relations a little bit. Uh, I would imagine uh, the solution that would make everybody in the Canadian cabinet happiest would be if the U.S. and China were to have some kind of back-channel dialogue and the U.S. government would eventually withdraw the extradition request. Because at that point, the process is over and Ms. Meng can go on flying to Mexico, which is, I think, where she was bound. That's right. Uh, all right, uh, uh, Professor, uh, appreciate your time on this. Uh, good to get uh, your expertise on what we might watch for next. And I uh, hope we get a chance to talk again soon. Take care. My pleasure. Thank you.